Monsters HD. Well, it was kind of Al and myself. Uh, we got involved with making a picture called Blood of Dracula's Castle, which uh, I rewrote into that. It was something else. And that was lost to a lab. And when we lost that, uh, we were very upset. We decided we'd never get into a situation where we lost the rights to a movie. And we held on tenaciously to our films. So we had made Satan Sadus, which was a big exploitation motorcycle film, yet to open, but it was filmed. And we knew it was going to be a hit. And we decided to do a horror picture following that up, originally called Blood Freaks. And the original script uh, was something Al had done and I had worked on with the writer. And we kept evolving the film, kept reshooting it and changing it. And I felt it needed the biggest horror characters in it, Dracula and Frankenstein, or Frankenstein monster. And so I kind of revamped a lot of the concepts that were in the film to have those things in the film. And uh, that's how it became Dracula versus Frankenstein. It first started as Blood of Frankenstein. And uh, it went through a lot of reshooting and re-editing and changing and uh, the kind of thing I despise but I'm known for. <laughs> it's just a lot of, you know, the best kind of movie I like is you set a schedule, you go out in three weeks or two weeks, shoot it once, edit it properly, have it finished, put it on the market. That's the kind of film I like. But these other types, they kind of linger along and they stay with you in your life and they never get finished. They just go on and on and on and they get changed a little to the right and a little to the left and uh, eventually they become something. But because of the kookiness of it and the horror character names, it became the most famous thing we've been known for. The original cast that we wanted of the star names, we wanted to have Roger Crawford, who had worked in a previous picture of ours, as the police inspector. That's the part Jim Davis got. But Al had worked with Jim Davis. When Brad Crawford was working, he then took Jim Davis. So we got Jim Davis. And then we wanted to have, at least I wanted to have, Paul Lucas as the doctor. So I was talking to Paul Lucas, and uh, he asked me, why did I choose him? I said, because his Hungarian accent was very much like Bela Lugosi, and it would be good in a horror film. So he said, all right. So I said, look, I want to ask you a question. You were on the show for Universal recently and you had a nice hairpiece. Is that yours? Can we get that hairpiece? He says, not my hairpiece. That belongs to Universal. We can't use that hairpiece. You want hair for me? You have to get your own hair. So I said, could we go to Max Factor and make a good hairpiece for you? That's up to you, but the Max Factor could make a good hairpiece. So then I kept working with him on this script and he finally turned it down. He says, Sam, I can't do this picture. It's entirely too bloody. Sounded like Lugosi, but it was too bloody for him. So he was out. We next got um, my thought of having Francis Letterer, who had worked for Hemisphere Pictures in Terror is a Man. He was a fine actor. And uh, he had also been in a picture called Return of Dracula, an independent film. And he had a Czechoslovakian accent, but he gave a strangeness to the role. And he was willing to do the part. He didn't have any problem with the script or anything. However, he was a banker in Canoga Park, California, and he was going to a convention of bankers in Washington, D.C., and he couldn't be there when we had scheduled the shooting. So we, we sent Al to this agent, Jerry Rosen, and Jerry Rosen uh, offered us two people for the price of one, J. Carroll Nash as the mad doctor and Lon Chaney Jr. as his assistant. But nobody had ever met them. Nobody knew why they hadn't worked in many years, how sick they both looked, how ill they were, but they were names. So because the price was good, and, oh, that's J. Carroll Nash and Lon Chaney Jr., great. So we signed them. In the meantime, there was a dwarf role, and I wanted Angelo Rosito, who had been in a lot of Lugosi horror films. And I said, well, where do I get Angelo Rosito? I said, well, he's got a newsstand on Hollywood Boulevard. Go out and look for him. See what I do with it? Ha, 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 ha. I eat it. So poor Al, we're walking up and down Hollywood Boulevard looking for a dwarf running a newsstand. And uh, I mean, a little person, that's an expression today. 
PC, PC. So he kept looking for uh, Angelo Rosito with no success. And he said, if I can't find him tomorrow, Jerry Rosen has his own dwarf. We're going to have to go with his dwarf. So he couldn't find him. He went to Jerry Rosen. Jerry Rosen's dwarf was Angelo Rosito. And Angelo Rosito then was in two more pictures for us, Dracula versus Frankenstein, Brain of Blood, and Cinderella 2000. And it also helped put him back in films, which led to Mad Max. Both of them were not well. Now, the funny thing about it is, J. Carroll Nash could walk, but the part written for him was in a wheelchair. So everybody who's seen the movie didn't know the history of it, said J. Carroll Nash, who was so infirm he was in a wheelchair. Well, the answer is, he was in a wheelchair, but he didn't know how to use it. And he was steering into the wrong part and crashing into the set. And he kept wheeling over, it's a funny thing, over to the electrical knife switches that controlled the machines. And we had to chalk off the floor and said, don't go there, you'll be electrocuted. I'm here, here's, here's probably his last movie. You don't want to kill him on the set. So he kept, no matter what happened, as the scene started rolling, He's rolling the chair back to that. Well, I ended up seeing the serial, uh, Batman, The Batman, where he plays Dr. Daka. He had those machines of Strickfadden. He had those knife switches. He was the only one on the set who actually knew how to work it, and we wouldn't let him near them. And he never told us that, because I hadn't seen the serial at that time. But he was rather crusty. He was old, he wasn't feeling well, but he drove his own car to the set we have pictures of him standing. The wheelchair was only part of the film. Cheney, on the other hand, was dying of uh, throat cancer. And he had some very raspy dialogue and voiceover, which I eliminated. I said, we've got to make him mute. Well, Al would use him again, and he decided he would do a commercial to warn people about the dangers of smoking. And they shot this, but it was never used. And uh, this was his last horror film, Dracula vs. Frankenstein. He lived uh, much longer than that. I thought he died within a couple of months, but he didn't. But it would be the last uh, screen appearances of uh, J. Carroll Nash and Lon Chaney. It has a lot of unusual things in it. Uh, the casting of our stockbroker, Roger Engel, as Dracula being the most odd one. And uh, Forrest Ackerman gave him the name Zandor Vorkov, so he sounded like something. Who are you? I am known as the Count of Darkness, the Lord of the Manor of Corpathia. Turn here. But uh, he's still around, and he looks very much like uh, he did in that film. And the funny thing is, as much as I was for John Carradine playing that role, in the years that have succeeded the making of the film, Roger being in that picture has made it more strange than if John Carradine had been in it. People always ask about the question why there are two monsters built, the monster and the creature. What does that mean? Well, what happened is we shot most of the film in Los Angeles. We had an office at Hollywood Stages, 6650 Santa Monica Boulevard. It was kind of the central location for B-picture filmmakers. Uh, a lot of films were made there, Nightmare and Wax, The Two Had a Transplant and a lot of the same sets were used. You'll, if you've seen these other films, you'll notice a lot of the same sets that we had were used, and we shot in the building, on the roof, in the alley, as everybody did. So we shot there, and the monster was played by John Bloom, who had been uh, brought to us because he was the creature, the large seven-foot-four guy in the two-headed transplant. He had the head grafted onto him. So we figured John would be great play the monster. So we got John Bloom to play the monster, and he's the monster in most of the film. And uh, the funny thing is, when he was being made up as the monster, he was grumbling and he was saying, oh, when are we going to get this thing done? I've got to get on Merlin. I said, John, what, what's your problem? He said, I'm an accountant, and it's tax season. <laughs> he's a the Frankenstein monster, seven foot four, is an accountant. <laughs> Incredible. Anyway, uh, the question of who the creature was, uh, we got an idea to film a new ending to the film because when the film was originally completed as Blood of Frankenstein, it didn't cut it for me. I felt it needed the fight of the monsters, Dracula versus Frankenstein, 
and we should film it in some place weird. And my wife had known of an old abandoned church in Somers, New York, upstate. And we went and filmed 8 millimeter footage of it to show what it was and gave people a screening. And everyone agreed it would be good. So we brought Al in, Regina in, and some other people in from the coast, but drew the line at bringing others. And we were stuck with who to get. So a friend of Roger Engels, who played Dracula, Zandor, was Shelley Weiss, who was a music producer. And he was about six foot eight. Didn't quite make it to seven foot four, but he was about six foot eight. So we put the head on him and the outfit on him, and he played the monster in the last reel and a half, last two reels, for the big fight at the end of the film, because we couldn't bring John Bloom in. But I didn't feel right about billing both people as the same monster, so I put another type of uh, thing there. I call it the monster and the creature, but it was really the same thing, so people wouldn't be thinking two people played the one role. Regina Carroll, who married Al, who became his wife, she was a dancer and she'd worked in films. She worked for John Ford. And he met her at her father's luncheonette. He came in to have lunch down the block from Hollywood stages. And she was there uh, in from Las Vegas where she had an act. You're nothing's way a town dear. Well, after all, a girl needs the basic essentials. But she was doing nothing for a week or two. So she was waiting tables there. And she came over to Al and she spilled coffee on him. And uh, that's how they met. And my wife claims that she said she did it deliberately. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's legend. But he got involved with her. He cast her in Satan Sadus. And they became an item, as they say, in Hollywood. And uh, from there, she was in other films. And they got married. And then acting didn't seem to mean too much after that. She liked being part of the family company. Our company was all of us who were in it. Dan Kennis, my partner, and his family. Al Adamson and Regina, my family, it was kind of a family operation. It's the original equipment from Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. It absolutely is. Now, how did we get that? Fari Ackerman, who is still with us, he played Dr. Beaumont in the film, or as we call him, the bad Dr. Beaumont. <laughs> he, uh, he knew everybody in Hollywood, knows everybody, and Ken Strickfadden was a friend of his. And I said, could we get Ken? to have his machines and everything in our picture. I think it would give it a certain touch. So he said, I don't know. So he called him up and he said, OK, bring Sam out and come out. And he had a huge garage. It was like an airplane hangar loaded with crazy equipment. And he said, I'm busy right now, but, but you come here, stand here. And he led me by the hand to the end of a table. What I didn't know was he was having me walk onto a steel plate. And from the opposite side of this hangar-sized garage, he flipped a switch and sent a bolt of lightning to my toe. And I just jumped up in the air, and he was laughing. Ha, 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 ha. So we knew who was in charge from that moment on. Well, he agreed to work on this. And at the last minute, he refused to come to the set. Something bothered him. But he said, I will rent the equipment to you, and I'll show your people how to use it. And so they did. They absolutely did. Came and got it. I had to work on building that set the previous weekend, and then the equipment came and was put in place. Well, once we got it on set, of course, most of it didn't work. So Al was furious. I was upset. So I said, Al, don't worry about this. Ken Strickfadden's a good guy. He'll make it up to us. We'll send Gary, that's Gary Graver, the cameraman, over to Ken Strickfadden's house, and he'll shoot close-ups against black background of all these things working. Then when we got, get to the lab, we'll just cut them in. And that's pretty much what they did in Universal. There are many gadgets that are not on set. We sent Gary Graver to Ken Strickfadden's place to shoot close-ups of the machines that weren't in the film. And I said to Gary, when you go there, get some other good ones that we didn't have. Who's going to know? So that was all shot and cut into that scene. So all of them didn't work on set. But I had a promise, Ken Strickfadden, I had a right in my agreement with him that I would never reuse those machines as stock footage in another film. Because Universal did that to him. They'd hire him on one movie, put the machines on set, shoot close-ups of them, and then they'd have him in five other films and not pay him. 
is very upset. Let me say this about movies. It's about any motion picture. Uh, films can have an organic ending, and the organic ending, in my feeling, is based on the whole movie. The whole screenplay and the whole direction the film has taken lead to the conclusion of the film, which should be a climax as well as conclusion. And it should satisfy the viewer that we've answered all the questions unknown to them. Now, there's some films that don't end. They just stop. It's just like the film is running and running and running. There's a story, and then, boom, it stops. Hey, what happened to that? What happened to this? What happened? And that was what this film was. This had one of these endings that just stopped. And what it was, uh, Dracula came to where the Frankenstein monster was holding Regina on that platform, or he was holding her, as the case may be. And uh, he kind of ran down the stairs, and along came Tony Isley, the hero, in a hearse. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. And he drove into Roger, uh, Dracula, let's say. And Roger was impaled on a pipe, and he just stood there. And the camera just panned away, and that was the ending. And I said, Al, this is awful in the extreme. Now, I was there when this was shot, and it was kind of improvised from what was in the script at 3.30 in the morning. I said, first of all, this pipe is dull. You couldn't impale a, a mashed potato uh, plate with that. So that don't, won't work. And the fact that all of a sudden he just drives in and pushes them against that, Dracula's too smart for that. That's not going to happen. And it was just terrible. So I just said, any film that's in this company that's awful to my taste, and I have a very liberal taste in exploitation films, I'll let a lot of things go by, but if I say it's horrible, I'm not releasing it. So I kind of had veto power in the company. I didn't control everybody and everything they were doing, but I had the veto power over the distribution. I just said, I'm shelving this. I don't care. And I did. And eventually I said, why don't we have the monsters fight it out? And they did. And what would they do? You'd expect the Frankenstein monster, bigger and stronger, to win. But I felt Dracula was more cunning, and maybe he had some other powers. And he will rip him apart. So he ripped one arm off, he ripped the other arm off, and then he tore the head out. Now I'm told that Monty Python adapted that for a film about the killing of a Templar knight. Now I've never seen the film, uh, but uh, Terry Gilliam used to share a desk at Warren Publishing with me, and he, he despised all our movies and famous monsters and Screen Thrills magazine and all that stuff we were doing, which paid the rent there, and he worked for Help magazine. That was a, an artistic failure. So he was very negative about that. So I always wondered uh, if he had seen Dracula versus Frankenstein and taken my ending. I thought it was a unique ending. And then Dracula threw the head away, and of course he had a run, and he's always trying to escape the sun. And uh, we had a wonderful editor by the name of John Winfield who cut that last reel together, and he was, did it beautifully. The way he cut to the sh zoom shots, we shot a lot of zoom shots in and out of the sun, opened the aperture, closed the aperture, showing light coming, a lot of tricky things. And then he added a rooster crow, well, we were shooting it at sunset, doubling for sunrise, but that rooster crow coming in at that point was beautiful. And I tracked all the music, and I was the kind of quasi-music director on the film. And uh, Bill Lava, who wrote our score, had passed away. So when we came to the reshoots, I didn't want to repeat the music again. So I had to go and seek library music, which I did use. And some of it was very good and very effective in the way I had uh, Dracula running. I've got to get back to my coffin. They're all post-sync lines. There was no dialogue there. And then he fell. And that's as far as Al shot it. And I shot the last part of it, where we put him on that door, and then we began to deteriorate him. And being that we didn't want to go into opticals and match position and dissolves and all that, we used cutaways to the sun coming up and kept the music going, and in that was the rooster crow. And I thought, you know, for something silly like that, it was rather effective. And when Regina came out and she found the remains of Dracula, it was just kind of, kind of nothing, little pieces of nothing, and then she found the ring, 
and then she looked at it and she recalled, and that was Al's idea to do a kind of in retrospect some key scenes, recalled that and all the people who had died and then she threw it away and that was the ending. This picture is a weird film. It's had a lot of weird connections to it. The Dracula ring was made by my cousin's husband, Ruzi, who was a great jewelry designer. He had designed things for Hollywood movies. He did the Lone Wolf TV series, Emblem. Did a lot of unusual things. He did that ring for me, but he wouldn't give it to me. He wouldn't sell it to me. He wanted to keep it. And he had that in his store in the village, and the store was robbed, and all the jewelry was taken away, and that Dracula ring disappeared. And I've always felt it will turn up on eBay, or somebody will have it, or some character liked it, who stole it, who was wearing it. There's only one ring like it. I'm working with John Russo and uh, a whole group of people, Monterey Pictures, in uh, doing a picture called Escape of the Living Dead, which is based on an original uh, story by John Russo. It's now one of the top ten comic books, and uh, hopefully that will be filmed in the next six months. We have a cast, and it's on imdb.com. It's will name actors in the film. And John Russo will direct it. He's written it. I'm one of the producers working on that. I'm also finishing my UFO docudramas that I've been working on for many years with Al Adamson. We filmed all over the world. We sent up an airplane to pursue anomalous craft in Northern California. And uh, we're looking to see have uh, extraterrestrials visited this planet. You know, I've always asked the question, is there any intelligent life in outer space? But more importantly, is there any intelligent life on this planet? I haven't figured that one out. But uh, <laughs> we continue working and uh, restoring a lot of old movies. We've got hundreds of films in our company library. And we've restored two with UCLA Film Archive. That is The Scarlet Letter, the 1934 one, and Voice from the Grave or Sin of Nora Moran. So we've done that. So we have a lot of old nitrate pictures we'd like to restore. And uh, there's uh, no time to do it all, but uh, you try to do it all. There are people who absolutely hate it, and there are people who absolutely love it. And there are dozens and dozens of websites devoted to it all over the world. And they take frame captures, and they go into minutia, and it's just incredible. I, I can't tell you why. The Head of the Monster was done by a fellow by the name of Anthony or Tony Tierney, and he was very late in making that. He had to make a kind of a clay sculpture and then he had to do something else, you know, back and forth, maybe uh, make a plaster cast and then latex rubber. And uh, We were like two weeks behind on this and it never was ready. I told him, when am I going to see the head? Where's the head? Well, the head was never ready, never ready. Finally, I had to be a bad guy. You know, I try to be a nice producer not a rotten producer, but every producer has to be tough sometime or you'd never get your film finished. I said, Tony, if you're not here tomorrow morning with that head, the film is being made, but the monster is going to be wrapped in bandages like a mummy. He's going to be a Frankenstein monster and a mummy built in one. There'll be no special head. And that got him. I don't know if I was really going to do it, but I threatened him with it. And he was there. That was Monday morning all ready, and there he was making up uh, our friend John Bloom, putting the head on him. And I've kept that head all these years. I've gone from office to office. It always sat on one of the high shelves, and people would come in and said, is that the head from the Frankenstein monster from that movie? I said, yes, and we have it here. We want to show it on camera and give it its due. That head still lives, and some of the actual leaves, those dried leaves that it fell into when Dracula threw it to the ground, they're still on the bottom of the head. This is the original head or the mask uh, that went on John Bloom and a later Shelley Weiss for Dracula versus Frankenstein, for the Frankenstein monster. And uh, Tony Tierney was told by me, whatever you design for this head, just see that Universal Pictures doesn't sh sue us. We don't want to copy the Jack Pierce makeup. Well, he's got a flat kind of a head, but he's got this strap over here. He's kind of deteriorating here, over there. And the whole thing is over a, a hat block. 
that's where it is now because when we needed to throw it, it needed to be over the hat block. So it still remained on the hat block. And if you turn it over here, you'll see some of the Technicolor blood that was on it because there was some blood being used in that film. And if we go to the bottom, little of the remains of the blood, and uh, Dracula held it and he looked at it when he apparently pulled it up as if he had ripped it off and he, he looked at it triumphantly and then he threw it down and he did it very well because when he threw it down he did it with a sense of disgust. I don't know what that meant but it, it gave the film, the film has a lot of little touches that are hard to explain and they contribute to its uh, gestalt, its overall gestalt. And the funny thing about that film if I dare to criticize it, I am criticized. I learned to stop doing that. And people who love it, they don't want the people who worked on that picture to criticize it. They want to like it. They want to, they want to enjoy it. They want to watch it over and over again. And I'm pleased that they like it. Children, we leave you now as we fade into the sunset, taking our Frankenstein head with us back into the darkness from whence we came. Thank you very much.